evidence-based nutrition information focusing on addressing the root cause for imbalance. Food has the power to help you achieve lifelong optimal health without the side effects of prescription medication. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any other podcast platform. I am Stacy Seslowski, Functional Nutrition Registered Dietitian. And I am Leah Grace Barrick, Functional Nutritionist. Welcome, everybody. This is episode number nine of the Power of Food podcast. And this is the first episode that we are recording live. So this is a special occasion for us and even more special because we are welcoming our new guest, Kira Sudovsky, who is an Ayurveda medicine practitioner. And Leah, I think you are going to go ahead and give um, her a fair um, bio. Yeah, absolutely. We're so excited to have Kira on. I was just talking about how before we got on, right when Stacy and I started this podcast, I've known Kira for a while and immediately I knew she was someone that we wanted to have on. So we're super excited for this episode. It's going to be a really fun one. And Kira is amazing. Aside from being a wonderful human in general, um, she's also an expert in Ayurveda and yoga. And I've had the pleasure of knowing her for a few years now. Um, but Kira, Kira is a yoga teacher and Ayurvedic practitioner who is passionate about helping others find ways to heal their bodies and minds. She has taught yoga worldwide and sees clients one-on-one -on -one for Ayurvedic consultations to help them achieve their health goals. Kira is an avid traveler and her passion for yoga and health have led her to lead exotic yoga retreats all over the world. She graduated from the Kripalu School of Ayurveda and most recently completed an internship in India and and became an Ayurvedic practitioner from the Kerala Ayurveda Academy. Welcome to the podcast, Kira. Thank you so much, Leah and Stacey. It's so nice to be here. Awesome. I'm so excited for this topic. We were saying before that we started that this has always been a topic I've been so interested in learning more about. I just feel like it's it tells me like my personality. Would I wish I could learn more about it. So I'm so excited to learn from you today. Thank you. That that warms my heart. I'm really <laughs> happy to hear that. <laughs> Um, so we start off each week with a share. Um, that's the, been our habit, our, our practice the past few weeks. And so I'm excited to share this um, new obsession I've had lately with cooking with a food that I had never cooked with before, and that is prunes. So the reason is because um, I was actually cooking a recipe that is a traditional uh, Jewish holiday food called simis, which is where you simmer together prunes, carrots, sweet potatoes, um, sometimes a little bit of uh, sugar or honey or maple syrup, and it becomes this like delicious, sweet, obviously very sweet <laughs> um, concoction that you can't just eat by itself. But what I realized after making it was that that became this like delicious sauce that I used to put chicken into and cook that in like a slow cooker or an instant pot. And I swear I'm now addicted to using simmered prunes as a sauce. It was honestly so delicious. It's like very like caramely, like almost, you know, you could imagine that flavor. Um, but I now prunes and prunes are actually super healthy for you. They're good for your bones. They're good for your, they're high in fiber. So good for your digestion. Um, so that's going to be my new thing that I cook with. <laughs> awesome. I feel like most people, when they think of prunes, think of prune juice, you know, for like in the old, old people home, senior homes, yeah. that kind of thing. Yes. Um, and I've never actually cooked with them. So that's really interesting. I love that. Cool. Well, my share this week is actually a vegetable that I've been loving and I've been eating beets for as long as I can remember, usually roasted, but I recently made a beet soup in my Instant Pot, which I've had my Instant Pot now for like, I think two months and I have been using it so much. I love it. Um, but I made this beet soup and it was like beets, chicken broth, um, 
what else is in it? Coconut milk. It was celery, onion. It was so delicious. It turned out so well. And I will be sharing the recipe very soon. Um, so I will share that on my website and on my Instagram, but I was just loving it. I was eating it all last week. So I'm very excited. It's beet season. They're at the farmer's market now. So I actually just got some more this weekend, but I've been loving beets. And again, they're so, so healthy. So that is my share. What about you, Kira? So my share is avocados, but not for eating, but for dying. <laughs> I've been taking avocados and drying them out and then scraping out the flesh. And you can boil the peel and the pit itself and you can dye fabric. So I have an example. Oh, wow. This is a beautiful scarf. Can you see the colors? Yeah. So cool. <laughs> And it's just, I also dyed this shirt. Nice. And it creates a beautiful kind of um, very lovely earthy pink. Hmm. And it, it was really fun to do something that was, you know, different and creative and natural. So I, it was fun for me. That's Love amazing. it. <laughs> Some like tie dye with healthy ingredients. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. I bet you could also do something even with beets because I know they stain. So I'm sure you could do mm -hmm. some kind of fabric, you know, stain with that and cool. That's really Absolutely. awesome. And red cabbage also apparently oh. very good to dye with. Yeah. Very and cool. I'm sure turmeric too. I have far too many things that are turmeric. <laughs> it's, it's a little troubling. <laughs> yeah, turmeric is hard to get out. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. So let's just dive right in because this is a huge topic. Obviously, we're not going to cover all of it, but we're hoping to give you guys, you know, an overview of what Ayurveda is, how to find out how it applies to you, learn a little bit more about Kira and what she does with this work. So Kira, can we just get started and talk about what Ayurveda actually is? <laughs> Super. So Ayurveda is a holistic medical science. It's a legitimate medical science. Ayur means nature and Veda means knowledge. So it's the knowledge of nature. And it's really um, understanding the connection between humans and nature and how we can find balance between the two. Um, I found Ayurveda about six years ago, and I did not realize what a beautiful, vast science it is. And it has truly changed my life. It has improved my health. It has shifted my outlook and my perception. And I'm just so grateful that I found it. So I'm really happy to share it with others. It's an Indian medical science. Um, our hope is that one day it will be recognized in the West. It is not at present. Um, you know, people are becoming more and more aware of it, but there are certain organizations that are, are kind of pushing it forward to become a legitimate medical science in the West. So then we can have it covered through healthcare and insurance and things like that. And that's also my, my hope as well, because I think it's a wonderful addition to anyone who's suffering any sort of chronic disease, but also as a preventative medicine. Amazing. Yeah. So interesting. I love, yeah. I, I love that it's, you know, so connected in nature because so many people are so disconnected and so many, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but so many of the things with Ayurveda are natural medicines, herbs, foods, and they're so powerful. And, you know, this is the stuff we talk about over the podcast all the time. Um, but it's also, you know, a, lo a lot of overlap with functional medicine and food as medicine. So that's also why I've always been really drawn to it as well. It's always so interesting to, when I think about why the United States or Western countries are always the slowest to, uh, uh, um, to learn about natural, more natural ways of healing. You know, we're always so quick to like go into the laboratory and make synthetic mm -hmm. products to help us when, why aren't we going out into nature and figuring out like, you know, the a healthier 
options, you know, so that's always interesting to me. Um, but Kira, can you share with us, I know you sent me over to a little questionnaire as we were first starting to, you know, work with you. Um, and I figured out this, I filled out this questionnaire and it showed me these three different big buckets of sort of personality <laughs> traits. And I had never seen this before. So I think they're called doshas, if I'm yes. not mistaken. Yes. Um, can you kind of give us some more information about each of those and what that really mean or meant to me? Absolutely. So I'll back up just a little bit because um, Ayurveda is based on the five elements, which are air, water, ether, fire, and earth. And so those five elements break up into the three doshas, which you're describing. Um, and the three doshas are vata, pitta, and kapha. So vata is air and ether. Pitta is fire and water, and Kappa is water and earth. Now, we all have all of these elements, but some of us have a little bit more of one than we do of the other. Now, now most people, and I think you both discovered this when you took your dosha quiz, um, most people are try, have two predominant doshas. There are some people out there that are actually tridoshic and they have a pretty even balance of vata, pitta, and kappa, but that's, um, that's somewhat unusual. It's more common to have um, two doshas that are predominant. I know when I did mine, I was predominantly pitta and, pitta, yeah. and kappa. Is that the second one? Kappa. Mm-hmm. You'll yeah, often hear pronounced as kapha, but I want I want to let everyone know it's actually kapha. Kapha. Oh, I did yeah. not know that. Pronounce the H. And kapha. the other thing I've noticed a lot of people are pronouncing Ayurveda incorrectly. You can do it as two words. So it's Ayur and Veda. Nature and knowledge. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, Stacy and I both took the quiz. I already knew what I was, but I like to take it, you know, every year or so to see if anything changed. Um, but we were like identical. We were both primarily Pitta, secondarily Kappa. And I was just laughing because I was like, yep, that's 100% accurate. <laughs> well, it makes sense to me that both of you are Pitta. I'm Pitta as well. You two are Pitta Kappa. I'm Pitta Vata. Um, Pittas are fire, right? So, so pittas are go-getters. Um, we're all business women here. We're all entrepreneurs. Um, we're all thirsty for knowledge, right? The three of us love learning about health and nutrition and how we can better ourselves. So that's very common for pitta. You know, that 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 urge to learn and to achieve and to kind of climb up a ladder. What would be the other two, um, some characteristics of the other two? So Vata is very creative. Um, a Vata person is often a musician or an artist, a dancer. Vatas are all about movement, just like air and ether. So um, someone like an acrobat, um, someone who is like a cyclist, you know, they're just always wanting to move. And the Vata personality is very enthusiastic when they're in a healthy state. Uh, we'll talk about the imbalances later, but they're enthusiastic. They're great on stage. Um, Mick Jagger is a good example of Vata. Mm -hmm. They also have kind of um, long, lean body types, right? They don't have a lot of body fat. Pitta is more of a um, athletic build and they build muscle more easily. And then the last one, Kappa, which is earth, um, Earth has a thicker, kind of stronger body type, right? They're kind of like a tree trunk. And kappas are very loving. They're very nurturing. They make wonderful caretakers, um, parents. Um, when you think about someone in your life who's been like your best friend since like high school or grade school, they're probably kappa because kappas are very loyal. They will stick around, you know, it's like a tree, like the earth. And so they hold you, they hold space and they nourish you. Hmm. Awesome. Does that, so, does that resonate with you too, any of this? 
Definitely. A hundred percent. I like to always think of the three, like you said, Vata's kind of the artist, the Pitta's the CEO and the Kappa's like the nurse or the mom that you just want to like give you a hug, very nurturing. Yeah. Um, so I find it helpful to think about it like that. And I also think, you know, looking at the body types and how each one is a totally different body type is really helpful for people, especially, yeah. you know, in the society where we think there's one right kind of body that everyone should look like and then realizing oh there's actually like these three types there's in between and this is based on you know who I am in my dosha I think that's really helpful for people um in general you know just with body image and that kind of thing I love that and I will say um sometimes people take a little bit of offense with kappa but kappa um they actually are like incredibly strong and they often have the um the strongest immune system and they rarely get sick when they do get sick they get kind of wiped out for a you know a, a chunk of time but it might be three four or five years before they get sick it's much more likely that pizza and vata will catch something do you find that um like sort of opposites attract, like someone who's pizza might like attract somebody who's Vata or, you know, how does that work? I love that question because <laughs> you see, I've actually had the thought many times that I need to create a dating app. <laughs> <laughs> the Pittas and the Kappas together. You know? <laughs> like like have them both take a, a Doshik test and then try to match them up. Love that. Um, I will I will say that I when I think about the people in my life that have really wonderful relationships, they have this beautiful balance of pizza, kappa, and vata. So I do I do think um, there's something to that. Hmm. You know, the the pizzas um, will mod will motivate the the kappa. And then the kappa will ground the, mm -hmm. the fire and the air. I'm actually, I'm dating a, someone who's very Vata right now and, um, and I'm more Pitta. And so we're, we're having this kind of balance of the, the fire and the air. He gets me to like go out and do things that I'm not used to doing. And um, I'm kind of focusing more on like helping him with business and stuff. Like that. <laughs> so I, love, I love that because I feel like the more you're aware of it, the more you can lift up the, the positives of those personalities in each other, the more you are, you know, you more, the more you realize what's happening. Exactly. And also, you know, once you start to recognize your individual dosha, then you can use that knowledge to make changes in your life right now to prevent future diseases. Mm. And that to me is, you know, absolutely key. In the Western medicine system, we seem to, you know, we go and see a doctor and we get a pill for something, but they're not necessarily looking at the cause or, you know, what might come towards this person in the future? Like what are the things that they can do right now to prevent, you know, potential health issues in the future? Hmm. And Ayurveda is, um, is very helpful in that way. It gives you a whole new perspective. Awesome. So in terms of, you know, you know your dosha, how would one know if they were in balance versus out of balance? Because I know that's a big thing with the dosha and how it's presenting in your life. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a few ways. Um, first of all, you can go see an Ayurvedic doctor and, you know, discuss what your ailments are. Um, another way to do it is through the pulse. Um, the doctor will often take your pulse and they can tell you whether your Vata pulse is high, your Pitta pulse, your Kappa pulse. I will say in general, especially right now with the state of the world, most of us have a Vata imbalance. So, you know, in my personal practice, the thing that I seem to be working on the most is balancing people's Vata, finding ways to ground them. And part of the reason that we all have a Vata imbalance, unfortunately, is because of this, because we're on the computer a lot, 
Mm -hmm. You know, we're using Facebook Live, we're using Zoom, we're on the internet, Wi-Fi. These are all Vata activities. And when Vata is overstimulated, it can lead to anxiety, it can lead to panic attacks, um, because what's happening is the, the brain, the mind is moving around too quickly. Insomnia mm -hmm. is a huge issue for Vata. Yeah, we've talked almost every single week in our podcast about reducing, you know, or at least coping, trying to cope with stress and, you know, trying to have that calm meditation time during your day or shutting off the Wi-Fi and keeping your phone in airplane mode throughout the night. I mean, it's something that we address. I mean, I know we've addressed it in every single episode. I address it with almost every person that I work with because, I mean, we can't help the stress that we're being exposed to. We can only help the way that we react and then cope with it. And so having these tools that we intentionally include in our day, um, I think is like the only thing that we can do. Yeah. I, I would like to add, Stacy, also perception. Mm. So you know, stress is a part of life and we perceive stress as a bad thing stress isn't necessarily a bad thing i mean there's been a little bit of stress for you to to create these beautiful podcasts right but they're changing people's lives and you're helping a lot of people so um stress gets us out of bed in the morning stress there's a certain amount of stress that gets us to do things we don't want to do but if we can change our perception around stress and see it as something that might um, inspire us or encourage us to make positive changes in our lives, then it can actually be looked at as, um, you know, something that helps us grow. Wow. That is so profound, honestly. Like, I think we can all learn from that, right? I mean, if we could only just not get upset about stress and just look at it as a motivator and, you know, something to learn from. And yeah, I think that's really an amazing um, point that you're making right there. Super. Yeah, I love that. So <laughs> I'd imagine, you know, for someone who is Vata, because the world is in such a Vata imbalance, that would cause extra problems for them. But, you know, a Pitta and a Kappa would also probably be imbalanced from that, I'm imagining. So what would that look like if a Pitta was out of balance? And what would that look like if a Kappa was out of balance? Okay, super. So I'll just back up a little bit. So Vata, the Vata imbalance would often be um, anxiety, insomnia can also be um, issues related to joints and the bone arthritic arthritic conditions um, osteoporosis pitta is um, more related to gut disorders so gastritis ibs um, you know i have celiac disease and i'm predominantly pitta so like stomach issues have been a problem my entire life and then you two know this very well, that if your gut is not healthy, the body is going to express that in some way, and it often comes out through the skin. So pitta, another pitta disorder is skin disorders. So eczema, psoriasis, acne, um, these are all pitta issues. And then kapha is earth. So kapha, when there's too much heaviness, when kapha is too sedentary and too um, kind of sinking into lethargy, kapha has issues with obesity, um, weight gain, diabetes, upper respiratory ailments like, um, you know, sluggishness in the lungs, mucus, excess mucus production, and also depression. Depression is a big issue for kapha. So, um, if you think of the earth and you think of a kappa person who like doesn't want to get off their couch and doesn't want to leave their house, um, they sink into like a darkness and a depression. Mm. So it's um, to me, it's been a real eye opener to start to look at my own dosha and to think about things that I can do on a daily basis to prevent um, pitta related diseases that I know that I'm prone to. 
So that actually leads me perfectly into the next question is, how do you customize your dietary recommendations or even your own diet to, um, to meet your own needs? And like you said, prevent future ailments, things like that. Mm -hmm. Great question. So um, pits is fire, right? So we need to cool the flames of the fire. So pizza needs cooling foods like um, cucumber and aloe vera and bitter greens and even um, things that are a little bit sweet. You know, pizza has a tendency to move towards some um, anger and frustration. So a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of honey, a little bit of maple syrup or even like sweet grains can actually calm the flames of pizza. Um, Vata often craves things that are light and airy, uh, like, you know, popcorn and potato chips, but those things are not the best for Vata. So Vata needs grounding. Vata needs heaviness. Vata needs oil. It needs warm soups and stews and cooked apples. Um, and sometimes, and, and this is fascinating to me because it's different from yoga. In Ayurveda, they recognize that sometimes meat can actually be um, very healing for the body. Now, vata body types often have a tendency to, bite, to be quite slender. And sometimes their bones are weak. So often a meat stew is recommended for a vata. Um, and, and also because Vata brains are kind of spinning and they're up in the air, a raw food diet or a vegetarian diet might not be the best thing for a Vata because it keeps them kind of spinning. So root vegetables, a little bit of meat, those things will help ground Vata. And then Kappa, um, because Kappa has a tendency towards sluggishness, Kappa needs like spice and maybe even a little bit of caffeine or um, something that's astringent or bitter, something that like uh, wakes you up. A kappa person um, needs to be motivated and certain types of food can motivate you. So a little cup of coffee in the morning, um, maybe even a little vinegar, something that's got some sort of um, spice you know, a little bit of a kick. What I, what I love about this most is that it so, it, um, you know, parallels functional medicine in that, you know, each person needs, has different needs and that there is no one size fits all diet and that we should really need to individualize our recommendations as nutritionists and dietitians to meet each person's, you know, very individual, unique body types and, you know, personalities. So this it's perfect goes, you know, hands in hand with what you're saying. I love that. Yeah. And I, I love that you mentioned personalities because um, I gave a workshop the other night and we were talking about what can you do when you know that your friend is out of balance. So if you recognize that your friend is pizza um, and they're getting angry and they're frustrated, you probably don't want to give them a cup of black coffee, right? <laughs> well, that's just going to like increase the fire. So what can you give them? You can give them like water with cucumber slices in it, something that's going to cool them down. And then Vata, they're always cold. So you want to give Vata something that's warm and nourishing like golden milk that has a little bit of um, turmeric or nutmeg in it or cinnamon. And then for kappa, they need something stimulating. So you might give them like some, a spicy chai. So interesting. I love that. <laughs> and, you know, I've applied that to my own life in general, knowing that I am very pitta and also a little kappa. And I also wanted to mention, you know, the differences in digestive like power, I guess you would say. So pittas 
usually have a really strong digestion. So they usually do better with like raw foods and salads and that kind of thing. So it's always interesting when I see people who are, you know, on a raw food, vegan diet, kind of what you're talking about. And they're clearly so Vata and they're like all over the place. And I just want to give them like some beets (laughs) and some sweet potatoes and like something to ground them. Um, So that's really interesting. And then the kappa too, I totally see that in my own life. I don't do well with dairy. If I have dairy, I get really mucusy and just kind of bogged down. And so that must be, you know, that cop a little bit out of balance or so- something like that with the dairy in there. So it's just interesting because usually like I do fine with salad, but I know, you know, the vata next to me isn't going to do well with that. So it's just, it's so fascinating. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. I was that Vata girl like 20 years ago. <laughs> you know, wearing a hippie skirt, spinning around in circles, on a, having a vegetarian diet. And I was not grounded. I was all over the place. And now that I've changed my diet and I've changed my routine and I meditate daily, um, my feet are on the earth. And, and I will tell you, it's a better place to be. And it's a lot easier for people in my life to deal with me <laughs> because I'm much more grounded. Would you say that these doshas change with your age and your situation? Or do they are like, is that who you are? And you just have to like learn how to balance them. Beautiful question. So your, your prakruti, your true nature never changes. So who you are, Stacy, in this moment is exactly like who you were as a child. Like that, that doesn't change. What changes is the imbalance, the vikruti. And the imbalance occurs maybe from diet, maybe from routine or lack of routine, lifestyle, you know, career. All of these things can kind of throw us off balance and take us away from our true nature. So Very interesting. interesting. The yeah. other, uh, the other thing that I noticed just from being a pitta in general, and kind of what you were saying, Kira, about how you used to be the ungrounded vata. Um, it's funny because I feel like we're often drawn to the things that cause imbalance. So, you know, the Pitta wants to be in the hot Bikram yoga class and that's like the last place they should be, <laughs> but it's always full of Pittas. And it's just so funny because once you think about it, you're like, oh, it makes so much sense that that's just igniting their fire and it's just going to make them that much more Pitta when they should probably go for a swim or something like that. So it's just, yeah, it's really, I geek out about this. <laughs> yeah, that's so right on. And I, I, w- I was laughing the other night during my workshop because it was late at night and there were several women on the workshop who were snacking um, while the workshop was happening. And I kind of looked around at each one and I realized that they were all vata. <laughs> you know, and they're eating like popcorn and potato chips while they're Um, watching the workshop and I thought, you know, this is interesting and this is important knowledge that we can use um, not only to understand ourselves, but also to understand others. And, And maybe with that knowledge, we can offer a little more empathy. You know, we can, um, if we understand that someone is high pitta, and we recognize that they're angry because they're working really hard, um, they're stuck at home, you know, they, they're, they've got three kids, and so their pizza is through the roof. Instead of making a judgment about it, we can kind of sit back and just offer compassion and recognize that that's not actually their true nature, they're just out of balance. Very cool. Yeah, that's a really beautiful way to look at it. So moving on, our next question was kind of, we covered it a little bit, but it was basically, you know, what in general should we eat based on our dosha and what should we avoid? We did just cover a lot of that, but is there anything else you want to add to that, Kira, before we move on to our next question? Um, As far as diet is concerned. Yeah, just as far as diet or anything, you know, that each um, dosha should focus on. We kind of covered it all, but I didn't know if you like had anything else that you thought might be important for that. 
I think you're asking a really important question that people will want to know more about. So I'll just really briefly give the basics for each one. Sure. So in order to reduce vata, um, you want to eat things that are sweet, sour, and salty. Okay. And then to reduce pitta, it's sweet, pungent, and bitter. And, and something that's pungent would be like ginger. Uh, kapha needs needs also needs pungent like chilies you know something that's spicy also bitter and also astringent and astringent could be a little bit of wine it could be vinegar it could be some coffee so would you say that we like innately crave those foods that you just said or we crave the opposite and you want like you think we should sort of force ourselves to eat the way to like rebalance ourselves you know does that make sense that question yeah that's a great question we we often crave what we already are so the um the vata person wants to eat popcorn for dinner the pizza person wants like spicy mexican food and the kapha person wants like a big bowl of yogurt <laughs> but those are not the best foods for us so um, we need to adjust and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to remove those things completely, but you might shift the time of day that you're eating them. So for example, if you're gonna eat a big Mexican spicy meal or you're gonna eat a big bowl of yogurt, you wanna have that in the afternoon, which is the pizza time of day between 12 and two, because that's when our digestive fire is at its strongest. And that's when your body can actually churn up that meal pretty easily. If you eat that bowl of yogurt or that big burrito at night, it's gonna sit in your belly and it's gonna disrupt your sleep and you're gonna wake up and feel kind of groggy. So the amount and the time of day is important. Do, does the time of day, is that different for different the different doshas? So there's a whole, um, there's a whole breakdown. Um, and, and so every four hours, we switch from vata to pitta to kapha. So I'll just start with the, the first section. Um, between 6 a.m. or 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. is vata. And then at 6 a.m. it switches to kapha. So that's why it's important for us to wake up at sunrise because vata is um, a more active time and kapha is like a, a heavier time. So you, you can start to structure your day based on the three doshas. It, it, it sounds complicated. It's actually not that complicated. You can make a chart and then you can pay attention to, um, this is the best time for me to exercise. This is the best time for me to eat. This is the best time for me to sleep. And really it makes sense because it's in alignment with nature. Like waking up when the sun is coming up, going to sleep when the sun goes to sleep. Love that. Yeah, <laughs> that makes so much sense, especially, you know, during the pitta hour in the afternoon. A lot of people don't realize, but in Ayurveda, maybe you can touch on this more, but that should be your biggest meal of the day. And I think a lot of times in our society, you know, dinner is the biggest meal of the day. And so if people can shift that a little bit and, you know, eat the hardest to digest foods during the pitta time, like you said, from 12 to two, that can help a lot. And then eat a lighter meal, I don't know what six to eight or whenever people have dinner is, is that, would that be kapha time? Um, so 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. is kapha time. Okay, yeah. so that makes sense that you wouldn't want that big meal then. Exactly, so we, I usually recommend to my clients to really try to stop eating by 7.30 p.m. And you know, if you need something in the evening, maybe you have a little bit of fruit or you have a nice cup of tea, but anything that you eat after 7.30 p.m. is really just going to sit in the gut and it's not going to digest well. So that leads to weight gain. That leads to irregular sleep. It can maybe even give you bizarre dreams. So paying attention to these things is important. 
So you're saying that in Western medicine, we're finally catching up and calling it intermittent fasting, but in Eastern in this type of medicine, they've been doing this forever. <laughs> yeah, but the fasting period is smaller. You know, it's um, during the sleep cycle and then also in between meals. So Ayurveda also advocates um, maybe four to six hours between each meal. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really advocate skipping meals except for kapha or potentially during an illness. But for both pitta and vata, they really need um, three meals a day, especially pitta. You know, a pitta personality, um, they're achievers and they're often athletes. So I know a lot of athletes right now are into intermittent fasting um, and that at noontime, they're like so angry and they want to kill somebody <laughs> because they haven't eaten breakfast. So, um, you know, the, the, the fasting periods are just a shorter period of time. So interesting. Awesome. I, I wouldn't, I rarely recommend to my clients, you know, these 12, I know some people do 12 hour fasts and they work and they lose weight. Um, but it's not the best for every individual. Totally. I think that's really important, you know, because people hear intermittent fasting has all these amazing benefits and it's so great and their friend got all these results, but you know, we're all so different. And like Stacey said earlier, that's why Ayurveda in my eyes, you know, is so similar to functional medicine where we really do look at each person as an individual. So that's awesome. Um, in terms of the cyclical nature during the day of the doshas, is there also a cyclical nature of the seasons with Ayurveda? And mm -hmm. should we change what we're doing based on what season it is? Mm -hmm. So I'll cover that in a second, but I did want to, um, I had said the Vata time, and I think I was off a little bit. So I just want to make sure I have that correct. It's 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. Okay. Okay. So the seasons, um, the Vata season is right now, right? It just started in October. October. So Vata is um, fall and winter. It's when the leaves start to change color and fall off the trees. The temperature gets colder. This is the time when we need more warming foods. We need to put on our big cozy sweaters. We need to nourish ourselves. And then the pitta season is summer, you know, when there's more fire, the sun is around longer. That's when we need a cooler diet. Um, that's when we're actually more active. And then kapha is spring, right? There's more moisture in the air. Um, there's more likelihood of like upper respiratory stuff. Um, kapha is also like, you know, wet and damp. So that's the spring season. So interesting. And so just thinking about how summer is very pitta, it's hot out. And I remember, I can't remember if this, like what study this was, but I know a study came out that said like when people are warmer temperature wise, they get angrier and they're quicker to temper, um, their tempers quicker. And so I, in my mind, I'm like, oh, that's so pitta, you know, their pitta is <laughs> aggravated, they're out of balance. But it's just funny when you hear something like that. Um, and it, it totally makes sense. Yeah, I'll give a good example, a personal example. Um, I lived in Southern California for six years. I had a convertible. I'm a yoga teacher, so I was driving around from this studio to that studio to this studio, drinking hot ginger tea, and my skin was like really reactive, you know? And I felt like angry all the time. And here I am a yoga teacher. <laughs> so in retrospect, it's like, I was kind of doing everything wrong. I was moving around too much. My diet was too heating. I'm out in the hot sun, which as you mentioned, can be aggravating to Pitta. And so once I learned about my dosha and I started to recognize that these things weren't so good for me, I moved to a cooler climate, right? I moved to Portland, Oregon. I, uh, I got rid of my convertible. <laughs> <laughs> I, I stopped drinking ginger tea like three times a day because now I recognize like I can have a little bit of ginger 
but if I have too much ginger, that's actually not good for me. And, and I will start to have skin rashes. I also find that it's interesting that um, obviously the types of fruits and vegetables and plants that grow during the different seasons seem to benefit. And there are even studies that show that if we eat more seasonally, like the fresh fruits and you know vegetables that are growing during that season, then we can be more healthy. And it might be like, if you think about the, the berries and the peaches and plums that grow in the summertime that are so cool. And then during the winter when like the root vegetables are in season and things like that. So it seems to match um, you know, the season seems to match our needs as humans. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so what about like specific practices? Are there anything that you, is there anything that you, you know, activities that you, um, that you use to like sort of help yourself throughout to balance your, um, doshas? So um, the main one I want to mention, because this is the Vata season, fall and winter, and the temperature is starting to drop, is Abhyanga, which is oil massage. Um, it's a wonderful way to remove metabolic waste from the skin. It keeps your skin soft and supple. Um, and it's an act of self-love. You're basically taking oil, and you can get certain oils depending upon your dosha, you warm the oil, and then before you shower, you're rubbing the oil into your body, and you always want to move towards the heart. And so this also increases circulation. And the, the oil is nice and warm. You can also like rub around the joints. So you're really like pressing the oil into the skin. You know, anything we put on our skin is absorbed in like 26 seconds. So you're, you're getting it into the muscles, the tissues, the ligaments. Ever since I started doing Abhyanga, I've noticed not only has my skin changed, but I feel like my, my joints move a little more easy. Like my, my yoga practice has changed. And we have the Sadovskis, we have a history of um, chronic arthritis. So I feel like this act of oil massage is preventative medicine for the future. I love that. I actually use castor oil wow. in the in the night when I am one of those people that can't like stop my brain from <laughs> running all night long. So I do that and I rub it on all of my like like behind my ears and my wrists and it has changed the way I sleep completely awesome. changed yeah so i write and i you could, you could rub it on your belly if you're having digestive issues oh okay. your head yeah yeah can yeah. i ask stacy why you chose castor oil i think i learned it from uh, probably another podcast that i was listening to or just somebody else's recommendation i did a little research i was like let me try it i was will i i have trouble sleeping and that was i was like will you when you when you have trouble sleeping you're almost willing to do whatever to, totally. to make it better when you're lying in bed at night can't sleep it's just a terrible feeling so i was like i'll give this a try there to kid there's no long-term side effects to this there's no pills i'm not like swallowing you know medications or anything so i tried it and it really, really helps. Oh, that's great. Would you well, recommend something different other than castor oil? Um, pizzas often do well with um, almond oil or coconut because they're cooling. Um, vata does well with sesame, so does kapha, because sesame is more of a warming oil. But you can buy, um, Banyan Botanicals is a great place where you can buy specific oils specific to your dosha. So they have an oil for vata, pitta, and kapha, and they usually smell really lovely. And uh, it, it really is an act of self-love to do this beautiful thing for yourself, mm -hmm. and especially I, before bed. I do love the smell of coconut and almond. Those are two mm -hmm. of my favorite smells. I'm afraid that I would like the smell so much that it would keep me awake. You <laughs> <laughs> can lavender. Put some lavender in there. Yeah, that's but that's true. the other fun thing is to heat up your oil and then, you know, add whatever essential oils you want so that it smells nice as well. Yeah, that's a really good idea. 
So aside from the the Abhyanga, is that how you say it? Abhyanga, yeah. Abhyanga. Are there any other practices, Ayurvedic practices that you really like or that you tell your clients that you find really helpful? Um, the not snacking between meals, I think is super important. Making lunch your largest meal of the day. And then, you know, if you don't already have a meditation practice, I highly recommend everyone watching this podcast to start, even if it's five minutes in the morning, especially now when everything feels kind of chaotic and COVID numbers are going up and there's a lot of stress and anxiety. So I make sure that every morning I meditate for 11 minutes. It's the first thing that I do when I wake up. Yeah, that's awesome. That's another thing that Stacy and I, it feels like almost every episode we talk about a meditation or a meditation app or recommend doing it in some form. So that's really great. Um, is there anything else? We covered so much, Kira. This was amazing. Is there anything else that you feel like we should cover? Or do you feel like that was a pretty good overall overview of everything? I think that's what we've covered has been amazing. Um, the only thing I want to emphasize is really for each individual to, to dive into this um, in their own way. You know, there's plenty of wonderful authors out there. There's free dosha, dosha tests online, you know, and you might take one dosha test and get one result and take another test and get another result. And then you feel a little confused um, so then you might consider going to see an Ayurvedic doctor, have them take your pulse, find out your dosha, what they think your dosha is. Um, but my whole point is that this is a process. And it's really a process of knowing yourself. And so once you start to know yourself better, then you know what practices work for you. And you know, what are the things that I can do on a daily basis to bring myself into balance? And what that is for me is different than what it is for Stacy and what it is for Leah. So we all have to figure this out for ourselves. So whatever you can do to, you know, really um, get to know yourself better and figure that out, it's going to make a huge difference. Awesome. So beautifully said, Kira. Can you let our listeners know how best to find you and get in touch with you? So my email is down below. I actually do um, Ayurvedic consultations by donation. I believe that this is my dharma and I don't turn anyone away. So uh, the first consultation is usually one hour and we talk a lot about daily routine, nutrition, and then, um, you know, any sort of health concerns. And I usually give about four or five suggestions as to what that individual can do to create a little more balance in their lives. And I've noticed even one session can make a huge difference for someone. So if anyone's interested, I'm more than happy to do that. Kira, I learned so much from you. Not only that, but you have such a soothing and calming oh. way about you <laughs> that I honestly feel like I just got through a therapy session in the past hour. So <laughs> I feel so calm and relaxed right now. I'm ready to go enjoy the evening. But um, thank you. I really do appreciate this. I'm sure okay. Leah um, feels the same. Definitely. Well, Thank you so much, Kira. And I, I love what you're doing. You're doing such good work. And I'm, I'm so grateful that you invited me to be here today. So thank you. We'll definitely have to have you on again in the future because, I, like I said in the beginning, there's so much more to cover. But I think we did a great job covering the basics. And I think this will be really helpful for people. So thank you so much, Kira. Have a nice day, you guys, and see everybody else next time.